Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to do this in person, which is we have opportunities to experience things like this as well, unexpected things. OK, so uh, this talk is part of a program by the IEEE to publicize some activity, particularly for the Magnetic Society. And what I'm going to be talking about today is some connections between the magnetics community and the quantum information community. And to an extent, and somewhat remarkably, these communities don't tend to talk to each other very much. They seem to talk past each other quite a bit. So I'm going to try to give you a few things of fla few flavors of things that are potentially of interest to the quantum information community that are coming from magnetic systems and uh, some things that quantum systems may bring also to magnetic communities. All right, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators here. If I can say, turn this off. There we go. My collaborators here, uh, so, uh, some of the things I'm describing is in collaboration with Dennis Candido, uh, Tian Yu Liu, and uh, Une Soikel. Um, and this is showing just some images of some of the work that we have been doing, but I'm particularly going to focus more on what's in this lower right category here. As I mentioned, this is sponsored by the IEEE Magnetic Society, and so they asked me to say a few words about this society to begin with. Uh, th this is a... It, this particular society sponsors a number of activities that are pretty important in the field of magnetism. And for those who might not be as familiar in the area of magnetism, I'd like to point them out. There is a fundamental meeting every year. This is the Triple M meeting, which this year is in Minneapolis. Uh, I'll point to this summer school, which is something that my students have taken advantage of many years, and which, of course, was on hiatus for a couple of years but is coming back for summer 2023. It's an outstanding experience and it cycles uh, essentially among the continents around the world. Uh, so I, I'm curious where they're gonna start it up again, but it's, uh, it's, an, it's an excellent program. And then I'll also point to the local chapters. Uh, many of these talks are coordinated with local chapters that sponsor IEEE activities involved in magnetism. And if you're interested in this, please reach out to your local chapter chair. So let's start with some comments about quantum information. And when I talk about this, I like to go back to what you could argue is a bit of the beginnings. Many people talk about this classic speech that Richard Feynman gave, but I like to go to a bit more of an IEEE beginning. So this is a paper uh, that was, well, you can tell by the typeface, it's quite old. This is a preprint form. It's in fact submitted in 1970 to the IEEE Information Theory Journal, which I also love, and was rejected, uh, and was published shortly after Feynman's classic speech in, again, a, um, an engineering journal. But it lays out many of the initial motivating characteristics of quantum information that you might care about. In particular, uh, it talks about conjugate coding, and here conjugate means that each element has a conjugate partner, and so you should be thinking about uh, quantum entities that can be translated into zeros and ones. Uh, from the physical realizations, this can mean spin states of something, an electron, a nucleus, an ion. It can be photon polarization or any of a wide variety of other potential realizations of quantum information. And in this paper, some concepts were put forward, uh, some ideas were described that I, th I think led to our later interest in, in real quantum systems. So for example, single copy messages, a message that you read and when you read it, it is destroyed. That's a curiosity. A quantum money, this is one I particularly like and I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, these things, while they might be theoretical constructs, thought experiments in the best or worst uh, form, depending on how you think about it, led to things like quantum key distribution and proposals for things like quantum teleportation. Right, so what do I mean by quantum money? 
I'll tell you that this is the very first, Quantum Mummy was the title of the very first quantum information talk that I heard. It was at the Institute for Theoretical Physics before it was the KITP. It's given by Charlie Bennett. And as a result of this, I said, I don't want to have anything to do with this field because it seems so totally impractical and I didn't come back to it for about 20 years, which, you know, you can, which perhaps is a calibration on my level of vision. So here's a picture of the quantum banknote from uh, this article by Charlie Bennett about 30 years ago. I like it a lot. It's a great picture of a banknote that contains 20 boxes, each of which has a photon with a, well, it's indicated as a uh, polarization, but in fact, this is a member of an entangled pair. And the other member of the entangled pair is sitting in the bank vault. And so if you want to know if your quantum banknote is counterfeit or not, you bring it back to the bank. And the bank does 20 bell measurements on these things. And based on the statistics, it tells you, is this, does this correspond to the superposition that we gave, the entangled states that we gave you beforehand or not? And it tells you, you know, yes, this is a good banknote. It tells you that, that's fine. But then, of course, they have to give you another one because they've destroyed the banknote in the process. So it's not a very efficient process. You, you can see how young me is hearing this talk and thinking this doesn't sound like a very practical financial system. But I like it in particular because it lays out, you know, perhaps four of the five DiVincenzo criteria that you might care about uh, for quantum information processing. It needs well-defined qubits. Those are these uh, photon polarizations sitting in these boxes. Uh, it needs long-term quantum coherence because if your polarization decays away over time, then uh, your banknote is worthless and you don't even have a way to verify it with the bank. You need a way to initialize so that you could put your uh, members of your entangled pairs in here. You need a way to read out. And all of this can be done very, efficiency, very efficiently in photon polarization in a system that is as non-interacting as possible. And so for somebody like me, who spent a lot of time thinking about many body physics and correlated systems and dynamics and things, you know, this is somewhat disappointing because it basically says you don't want any of that around because it's just going to get in the way. So what aspects of many body physics and magnetic systems may be of benefit? Well, it really comes down to this fifth criteria that is not on this slide which is manipulation. And so if you want to be able to manipulate the properties of things, one of the more efficient ways to do this is through interaction with materials. And for that, you need coherent materials. Uh, ideally, you want room temperature coherent materials. And so there are a number of examples of this. Uh, this is one that many people uh, in this room, I imagine, are very familiar with. Single spin centers in diamond, like the nitrogen vacancy center with exceptionally long coherence times. Uh, there are coherent effects in transport, essentially spin bottleneck effects that rely on coherent spin dynamics, even at room temperature. And then uh, this is a very popular one. Uh, this is a proposal that's currently championed by Peter Hoare, particularly that certain entities use uh, use quantum coherent components for biological sensing of magnetic fields. In particular, here's an image of a bird that uh, Peter and his collaborators believes navigates based on the spin chemistry of the system. Basically, the, the fact that in a test tube, the reaction products of certain chemical reactions change based on the presence and orientation of earth size magnetic fields. Now, this area sort of stalls a little bit because it's very difficult to actually ask the bird what it is doing and whether it is seeing something specific. So that's, that's sort of where that field is uh, uh, trying to resolve the dynamics now. So another element that I'd like to bring in before I dive into the magnetic systems is the fact that many of the quantum computing realizations that we consider right now are not going to be purely of one type or another. Uh, there is a focus on hybrid 
devices. And the example that I usually like to point to particularly is the superconducting quantum information case. Uh, so here's a picture of, the, of, an ex, of a transmon qubit. This is superconducting quantum information. Uh, and you know, the usual question is, where is the piece in this that really depends on superconducting properties? Well, this over here, this is a capacitor. Uh, it has a scale of about 300 microns, so it's gigantic. Uh, and if you take this little box over here and you blow it up into this over here, and then you blow it, you blow it up and you put these little tiny arrows pointing at it, that's the, the junction, the superconducting Josephson junction uh, that is giving the nonlinearity that you require in order to get your quantum information to work. So you could think about it as 99.9% .9 microwave photon quantum information, and just this little tiny bit of superconducting component that gives you that nonlinearity that allows you to separate the zero and one from the two, three, four, five uh, ladder of states that you would otherwise have for microwave photons. And there's similar aspects for ion trap based approaches, which are also hybrid in terms of cavity and atom systems themselves. So this is, a, um, as I've discovered, tremendously optimistic outline for this uh, presentation. Uh, and I typically pick either the top or the bottom to focus on. Uh, here I'm really going to focus much more on the top and only going to talk a little bit about the parts on the bottom. So if I'm talking more to uh, people who have an interest or are focused on magnetic materials, I tend to focus more on these. Uh, and if it's more on the optical side, I tend to focus a bit more on these. So this is, in the upper left, transduction between spin information and magnon occupancy quantum information. On the upper right, this is how you might use magnetic materials for entangling gates between spin systems. And then down below, this is uh, photon-magnon transduction and this is optomagnonics. So again, I'm going to focus really on the top two pieces more. Okay. So I'm interested in spin entangling gates. I'm interested in spin to magnon mode transduction. I want to work with a fruit fly of this localized spin system, and that's going to be the NV center in diamond. So I'm a theorist, I'm going to do theoretical calculations, but I'm going to take experimental information from various sources to justify the arguments I'm going to make. So this NV, this is a localized spin system. It's been used to sense local magnetic fields. Uh, the spin Hamiltonian is very well described by this up here. There's a Zeeman term, it's spin one. There's a zero field splitting term, which is this here in the axial and in the transverse components. And therefore, based on the direction and strength of the magnetic field, you can get two different precession frequencies, which allows you to use it in principle as a vector magnetometer. Now, a major problem with the spin-based quantum information that we'll come back to later is that this is a very, very tiny object. And trying to manipulate it uh, is, or trying to have it interact with others of its character means that you want to try to position NV centers that are you know, within 10 nanometers of each other, which is exceptionally challenging. So in contrast to the superconducting quantum information where the challenge is my system is almost a millimeter in size, I wanna make it smaller. Here the issue is my system is very, very tiny on the order of 10 nanometers and I wanna make it bigger like a micron in size. Right. And there have been some proposals for how you might do that, and I'll point to this one over here, uh, which came from Daniel Loss's group and motivated some of our thinking quite a bit. So I'm just going to describe what this schematic over here is supposed to correspond to. I've got two nitrogen vacancy centers sitting in diamond underneath this magnetic structure on top. This magnetic structure consists of these two circular disks, uh, which are connected by a one-dimensional spin chain from one to the other. And the idea is that the 
fringe field from the, uh, from the nitrogen vacancy spin, that magnetic dipolar field will cause this magnetic uh, moment, this huge magnetic moment to reorient along its direction. And then that will couple to the same situation happening in this disk over here. So again, this is like the quantum money. It sounds great and is completely impractical. Uh, anybody who's looked at magnetic materials knows that there's absolutely no way that this is not going to get pinned by some kind of imperfection sitting around the edge. Uh, that's going to be much more important than the presence of this little tiny single spin dipolar field over here. And then trying to get an interaction through a one-dimensional spin chain, I guess I won't even uh, start to justify that. So our motivation was to see, is there something in here that is practical or does it remain in the land of complete fantasy? So it's a theoretical calculation, but I'm happy to describe where we are in an experimental uh, effort that we're teamed up with to try to achieve this later on. Okay, so I'm gonna describe this as, uh, I'm now going to, instead of uh, going directly to the entangling type of gate between this, I'm gonna try to transduce quantum information from the NV spin state into a magnon mode, a magnon mode occupancy. So it can have zero or one magnons and that will correspond to where the spin is pointing. Uh, and the issues that I'm going to have with this are fringe field coupling. I want to couple that nitrogen vacancy center to the magnetic excitation here. But this is going to be a micron scale disk, which means that if I have a single magnon, if I'm responding to a single magnon, that magnon is going to be spread all over this disk, and its presence near the NV is going to be relatively small. So I want to look at a mode that is concentrated near the edge. This kind of mode uh, you can get, it's called a daemon eschbach mode, it's kind of like a whispering gallery, non-reciprocal mode that uh, circulates around the system, but it requires the magnetization to point out of plane for this, which is not always the uh, easiest configuration and sometimes requires a relatively strong magnetic field, which can be an issue for the nitrogen vacancy center. And then I want my NVs to be below the surface because I know that near the surface of diamond, there are fluctuating charge uh, dynamics which lead to decoherence of the NVs. So I'm going to expect that I'm gonna to wanna to be about 30 nanometers below the surface. Uh, and so that if I wanna to try to maximize my fringe fields coming from, the, from this disc, that means the thickness of the disc is probably on the order of 30 nanometers. So this, this number correlates with this number here. And then in principle, if this thing can work, I could put a second NV and you know, transduce from this spin into this magnon occupancy and then do the same back over here, but I'm not gonna worry about that quite yet. I'm just gonna ask, can I do this in some reasonable set of parameters that bear some resemblance to experimental values? So here's, uh, again, another picture of this. Uh, this picture introduces yet another challenge. Um, and, and now, by the way, I'm, I'm particularly speaking to the magnetics side of things. There are all these things you need to worry about in terms of the magnetic configurations that are essential for quantum information. Uh, and without them, it just won't work. So here, my diamond has a 111 surface orientation. That's because my magnetic field that's required for this disk is pointing out of plane, perpendicular to the surface. And that field has to be parallel to the NV axis of the diamond spin. Otherwise, it will decohere very rapidly. Uh, this, by the way, adds a tremendous amount to the cost of the diamond that's already pretty expensive and hard to get. But I'm a theorist, so my diamond is inexpensive. It exists. But, you know, all I care about is whether it, it in principle exists at the moment. Okay, and then I'm using this material uh, that I've labeled here with these uh, soup of letters. This is vanadium tetrocyanoethylene, uh, 
my chemist collaborators tell me if I don't say that at least once in a talk that they, they won't know me. They'll just, they'll, they'll cut me. So, so I have to say that. It's a, it's a magical material because it has a damping that is comparable to possibly less than yttrium iron garnet. And it is available to be shaped into a wide variety of, uh, of structures. You have evaporative deposition, uh, so it can be deposited at relatively low temperature and it can be patterned. And so disks of this structure have been made and they have exceptionally low damping. So I'm gonna use those experimental values when I calculate whether this might work. All right, and then now let's take a look at some other features of this because I need to match the excitation energy of my magnon with the spin excitation energy if I want to transduce one to the other. So that's what's shown over here. This is the uh, transition to the minus one state to the plus one state of the NV. So zero field that starts uh, here at 2.87. Then it comes down and it crosses this line. And so what I'm showing here is the uniform mode of the ferromagnet, the FMR mode as well as the higher um, angular modes with angular quantum numbers, one, two, three, et cetera. And you can see they're kind of stacked in together here because the disk is big. So that's a requirement because of the big size of the disk. And I need to be able to access one and only one of these crossings without having the line width of one of these overlapping with the other, because if it did, then I would get decoherence by decay into another magnon mode. So that's why the requirements on the damping are so severe. I need the damping to be uh, very small so that I don't get that kind of overlap. All right, and so then I can calculate, and it turns out it's possible to calculate these properties analytically, although surprisingly it hadn't been done to our knowledge before, uh, you can calculate the edge confined magnon modes like this uh, and the chiral fringing fields that exist below the disk that are then going to couple to the NV. And now I'm going to make another comment about this material, which is surprising and it turns out to be surprisingly useful. The saturation magnetization of this material is very low compared to YIG. It's about 20 times less than YIG, which means that this offset over here starts here rather than way out over here. If I was looking at this with YIG, I would not be able to cross YIG with this line and still keep my zero state as my ground state. And again, the diamond people hate that because then you don't have a way of polarizing this. So this is a magical component of low saturation magnetization material um, for this out of plane configuration. Hope I'm starting to convince you that, that actually getting this kind of thing to work will be quite challenging. Now I'm going to try to convince you that it's worth it. Okay, which is, I'm going to do that by calculating the cooperativity of the system, going from the NV spin excitation to the magnon occupancy. And so the cooperativity here is essentially the number of oscillations that you can have between the two types of quantum information prior to decoherence. You want this to be at least one, I want it to be a lot bigger than one because uh, the efficient, the fidelity is then going to uh, depend on this value, the cooperativity. So the terms that appear in here are the NV magnon coupling, which for this configuration with this micron size disk is about 10 kilohertz. Magnon damping rate, which is about 100 kilohertz. So even with essentially the best damping that we've seen in any kind of material, this, damping, this decay rate is still gonna be larger than this, than this coupling in this configuration. And then the NV coherence time, which I'm going to take as a very, very good experimental low temperature NV coherence time uh, from this reference here. And so based on that, we can get, uh, based on that, we can get a cooperativity calculated from that 
that depends on where exactly you are under the disk. Uh, but in reasonable regions under the disk, it's of order 30, so well in excess of one. So I'm showing here uh, a couple of slices of this geometry. I'm showing a slice at uh, a level down below where you can see the coupling is very large to the, um, uh, at the very edge of the disk. And here this is a, is a cut, a vertical cut, so you can see the disk itself and then regions in the diamond underneath it. So again, 30 nanometers below the surface is where I'd want to be. Uh, the resolution of implantation, if I'm trying to implant an NV center to try to actually make this, is probably this white box, at least at the time that this was uh, published. Ago. And you can see that in that range, the cooperativity ranges from about 15 to about, uh, to about 30. So it's feasible. It's exceptionally hard, but it's feasible. And that's what we're trying to convince people of. Okay, so this is transduction between NV spin information and magnon information. Uh, but I've also referred to entangling gates. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So, you know, just to step back a bit and to address how you want to entangle perhaps two solid state spin one halves, the usual approach that you think of is that you have some spin spin coupling with some mediating entity. And that splits your singlet and triplet states, which allows you to take a configuration, say, where you have an upspin and then a downspin, which is a linear superposition of singlet and triplet, and evolve it towards a downspin and an upspin when you've generated a phase difference of pi between the singlet and triplet. And the connection of this to quantum information processing is that this operation, which we call swap, uh, is very closely related to the quantum exclusive OR, which allows you to do all quantum operations in principle. That quantum exclusive OR is the square root of the swap plus some additional single qubit operations. Okay, so we'd like to control J. And this is again my comment about the spin qubits being too small, because how are you going to get your two NVs to couple uh, in? Well, there's a dipolar coupling, but that's very weak and, uh, and still falls off relatively rapidly. You could try to do it with exchange coupling, but that's on a scale on the order of a nanometer. So you want to be able to replace the typical couplings that you might expect to get with a magnon mediated coupling. So that's the other major thing I'll talk about which is entangling gates via magnons. So again, we have our NV centers in our system, and now the diamond is, uh, uh, again, um, sort of invisible in this, uh, in this image, but the 111 orientation is pointing parallel to the surface, so at least I'm saving some money in, in this construction. And I'm going to consider a ferromagnetic bar with a easy axis that is also parallel to the surface. And now I've switched from VTC and E to another low damping material, which is yttrium iron garnet, the other sort of magical low damping material. Uh, and I can do that because my axis is now in plane rather than out of plane. So I don't have the constraints I had before. And the advantage of, the, of yttrium iron garnet is its saturation magnetization is 20 times bigger. And therefore, the fringe fields that you would get, the coupling strengths you would get, will be 20 times bigger. And so you can look at the method that you might get for coupling uh, one NV to a magnon mode, what kind of the strength of the coupling might be. Uh, and... Um, you know, it depends on exactly where it's positioned, but again, you'll, it'll be stronger when you're near the edges of this, of this bar, as you might expect. Now, this configuration that I'm showing here, this one-dimensional bar configuration, where the other modes are much higher excitation energies, has, a, has an interesting feature that at a finite 
wave vector, there's a minimum of the dispersion. This is a backwards volume mode in the magnetic material. And we're going to configure it such that our NV spin is detuned from that, not by much, because we want a reasonable strength of coupling, uh, virtual coupling, but it's going to be detuned. Uh, and we're going to take advantage, therefore, of the large density of states that you have of magnons at the bottom of that curve. Now, the magical thing about YIG is that the damping is so low that magnons can propagate for on the order of millimeters, which means that you've, if you make a bar that's maybe three microns long, any magnon that you have, whether it's virtual or real, in principle, bounce back and forth on the order of a thousand times, strongly increasing the coupling still further. So here are the calculations of coupling strengths that you would have from an NV to an individual magnon, and they are of the order of half a megahertz. So it's huge by comparison with the 10 kilohertz that we were looking at before. And the cooperativities that you'd calculate would be on the order of 50,000. So that's, that's a really nice, strong coupling. And it's coming basically because of the larger saturation magnetization and the advantage of this particular geometrical configuration. So now we want to look at the, uh, at the entangling rates for this being used as a gate. So now what's happening is that we're going to consider the magnons are virtually excited and producing the spin-spin coupling between these two NVs, which shows up as an entangling rate. That entangling rate is of the order of a megahertz. And what's nice in addition is that the gate to decoherence ratio is almost a thousand. So this is the kind of thing that would be very challenging to achieve without a very low loss coupling system between the, mag between the spins. And it's happening on a three micron scale without a lot of additional uh, machinery. If you try to do this with the photonic approach, the photon wavelength is orders of magnitude longer than the magnon wavelength, and therefore uh, it's much more difficult to, to do it on this small scale. Okay. Because I'm a theorist, I like to show at least some uh, details of how the calculations are done. These are density matrix dynamics calculations. We use Lindblad equations for simulating the features. We have various gate sequences in order to do these operations if we do it on resonant or off resonant. And then we can evaluate various quantities associated with the system, in particular, uh, you know, the CHSH violation, which is a measure of the violation, it's a measure of the Bell's inequality. Uh, and you can see as a function of interaction time that you can get these nice uh, oscillations that don't look too crazy. So again, a very hard experiment. The off resonant case, these detunings that we're taking are of the order of a few megahertz. So that's going to be extremely challenging. And constructing the system is going to be hard as well. But there is a pathway to possibly get these kinds of um, large entangling rates and uh, also large gate to decoherence ratios. Okay, so this is the thing that I wanted to spend more of my time looking at. Uh, there are some more details in this publication that look at how this depends on temperature uh, and detuning. I'm just going to comment about the temperatures involved here. This is another thing that's usually quite challenging for the magnetics community to be looking at 30 millikelvin, 70 millikelvin. The reason for this is exactly the same as why you work at such low temperature for microwave photon operations. You have a magnon excitation in the few gigahertz, and you, if you change the occupancy of that mode thermally, then you change the coupling rate between the two NVs, and that gives you gate decoherence, which you don't want. All right, so now I'm going to move to some comments about coherent coupling between light and matter. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a story that started us off into this 
adventure, uh, which was wondering about some of the fundamentals of these coherent operations where light comes in, takes you from the ground state to the excited state. And then, of course, you can have emission when you go from the excited state back down to the ground state. And if this is happening in a coherent fashion, then you get strong, a strong coupling effect between a matter excitation and a photon. And when we started looking at this um, in the community that we were, uh, the statement was, don't bother ever worrying about magnetic dipole because the electric dipole coupling is always stronger than the magnetic dipole. So this is the quantum dot picture of this. This is part of the community that I was paying attention to at the time. Uh, and this is uh, almost 20 years ago, demonstration of strong coupling between a photon and a quantum dot exciton. So the, this is a uh, little micro cavity that is created here. The scale bar here is a micron. So this is about 10 microns tall, one micron in diameter. There's a very sharp emission from a particular quantum dot. Uh, that's this uh, X over here is associated with the exciton of this. And the C over here is the cavity mode. And the insight that two groups achieved essentially at the same time was recognizing that if they change the temperature of the system, they could tune the exciton energy because the band gap of the semiconductor is changing with temperature. So as a result of that, as they went from, say, 30 Kelvin down to 5 Kelvin, the band gap is increasing, so the energy of the uh, exciton is increasing, and they could look at the anti-crossing with the cavity mode and demonstrate strong coupling, which in this case was about 80 micro EV. And so we really wanted to ask ourselves, is it possible to do better with magnetic systems than with electric systems? And you know, the way we, we looked at this was sort of a roundabout way, uh, as, as you'll see later on, for, for worrying about this. You know, but first we started thinking, what happens when you have a collective system? So this had been looked at to an extent with excitons, but we were wondering about this as well. So collective system might have a ladder of states that coherently exchanges photons with the cavity. And so you might continue to be able to move your, your state up and down, say if you have a large spin system. I'll point out that this is not necessarily an advantage in the case of superconducting quantum information, this is exactly what you don't want to do. You want to truncate this at just two states, so you have your zero and your one. We didn't actually know about that at the time. Okay. So we just thought about the case of collective spins, and we imagined that you had a, a nanomagnet that was behaving as a macro spin which are words that are commonly used in the magnetics community with a certain degree of uh, fuzziness. And spherical for various uh, reasons. And we place that in a cavity. And uh, you know, we realized shortly after that that essentially what we were looking at was ferromagnetic resonance. And I, you know, I like to uh, expand on this a little bit, which which I'll get to, but you know, the key advantage of this is that when you think about independent spins that are adding randomly, you get a coupling that goes like the square root of the number of spins. But if they're collective, they add coherently, and you get a coupling that goes linearly with the spin. So you get an enhancement that goes like the square root of s. So the idea was, if you get that enhancement, and your s may be 10 to the 9, you can overcome the fine structure constant reduction that you would otherwise worry about. And, you know, I, I like to put this up here because um, particularly in physics departments, many people are learning their solid state physics from Charlie Cattell's book. And most people who are doing that have no idea what Charlie Cattell actually did, and what his major role in this was. Uh, he really was um, intimately involved with considering these issues of ferromagnetic resonance. And so this is a classic paper of his describing ferromagnetic resonance absorption. Uh, and one of my favorite papers by him, in fact, was a calculation of the line width of ferromagnetic resonance for a Yig sphere, in which he was able to uh, correlate 
the line width that is measured directly with the size of the grit used to polish the sphere. Because that was the source of the disorders. Okay, so the advantage here, uh, as we discovered, as we sort of try to push this into the quantum regime, is that you have a magnetically tunable filter, you have a magnetically tunable object, you don't need to do temperature tuning. This magnetically tunable object is used already as a high quality filter in high frequency microwave circuits and oscilloscopes. So the, when we were talking with experimentalists about looking at these kinds of features, uh, they actually started ripping them apart. And so this is a picture courtesy of Hong Tang. Uh, he just opened up a, uh, I think this is an, this is an Agilent uh, oscilloscope and harvested this YIG sphere. Uh, and uh, that's where some of the first experiments on this were done. So the advantages are, okay, start with the disadvantage. Magnetic dipole coupling smaller than the electric dipole coupling by about a factor of 100. However, you get this advantage of the collective behavior of exchange lock spins. So if your spin number is greater than 10,000, then you can overcome this. You can get a much stronger strong field coupling between the nanomagnet and the photon field. You also have the advantage that spin coherence times are much longer than the exciton coherence times. And you can do, again, magnetic field tuning instead of temperature tuning. So this is our proposal, I guess, over 10 years ago to look at this kind of strong coupling dynamics. And uh, I think based on time, I'll skip some of this. this. This was part of our looking at the dynamics of large exchanges of uh, photons with the cav cavity photons with the nanomagnet itself. Uh, it shows up as, for example, ring down in the uh, excitation of the, of the sphere. Let's focus more on this. All right, so this is the first measurement of this effect. This is from Hans Hubel's group, uh, 2013, where they showed a nice anti-crossing between the magnetically tuned mode and the cavity mode. Uh, and this was done at low temperature, over here, this is from Hong Tang's group. This is done using that uh, little um, YIG sphere harvested from his oscilloscope. And this is, so this is room temperature. And this over here is showing the ring down of the excitation over long periods of time. So you know, even up to a microsecond, you can see large exchanges of many, um, of, of thousands of photons with the, uh, between the cavity and the, the magnon excitations. These are uniform mode excitations. All right, so I'm, I'm going to conclude by making just a few remarks about a nonlinear regime for this, where we're not just looking at microwave photon to, uh, to magnetic system coupling, but we're trying to develop a theory for an analog to cavity optomechanics. So in cavity optomechanics, you're able to couple to uh, very low frequency excitations, like those of, uh, of the oscillations of a mirror. It's the classic example uh, described here, where you have a, a movable mirror, and you're able to transduce between an optical photon and a phonon excitation. So this has a lot of interest for quantum memories, for example, because those uh, phonons can live for a long period of time, uh, and they are in a compact region. In principle, you can then come back in and transduce from your optical phonon uh, from your um, from your phonon into an optical photon again to continue on your way. And you do this in magnetic systems without any oscillations like this, without moving parts. You know, in principle, it's something that you can do. Whether it is better or not is a subject of continued debate. But in essence, you have a situation where you have a cavity again, and now you have a magnetic material which has magnonic excitations. We were interested particularly in traveling mode magnonic excitations. And the coupling is through the uh, mag magnetism dependence of the index of refraction. So as the magnons are excited, the index of refraction for the light changes, and that gives you your nonlinearity. 
Though simultaneously to when we were doing this, also Florian Marquardt's group was developing similar ideas, and in Cold Adams, uh, similar concepts had been developed by Dan Stamper Kern and his collaborators. Okay. And for reasonable parameters, again, uh, taking in this case a yttrium iron garnet magnetic waveguide, uh, you can see features that would look like electromagnetically induced transparency. So in this situation, the optical damping is much larger than the magnon line width. And so uh, the effective coupling is lying in between. So what's happening is the photon is coming in and then it gets converted into the magnon and it can stay there for a while before it comes out. That gives you this nice uh, feature in your curve. Uh, if you're in the other regime where the optical damping is less than the magnon line width, then by having the coupling between the photon and the magnon, you're opening up a new decay channel, and so you end up with a Purcell effect, and you get a nice uh, enhancement of your, of your decay mode. In addition, you can try to uh, pump the system and either achieve cooling of your magnons, which is something that we have some interest in doing because that might allow you to do these uh, coupling schemes at higher temperature than 30 millikelvin. You turn it around and illuminate your cavity with blue shift, blue shifted photons, and you can get an enhanced occupation of your magnon mode. Uh, our magnon line width here is going towards zero, which in principle, when it gets to zero, you should get something that is magnon lasing. All right, so that's a very rapid journey through that. I wanted to try to describe some of these material and device opportunities and how control of coherent dynamics is really helped by the magnetic materials. You have magnetic excitations that provide these low loss, strong coupling means to get quantum transduction or to get entangling gates. I hope I've also left you with the, uh, with the thought that quantum information technologies are going to be achieved with hybrid systems. It's essential to take advantage of the strengths of multiple material systems. And that new materials and new structures can really drive new science in quantum information uh, science, that cooperativities and transduction can far exceed unity using these magnetic materials. You can get gate de decoherence ratios in excess of 1,000 rates on the order of a megahertz. And I think there's a lot of uh, questions, you know, what new materials are waiting for this, waiting for us. I've really described just one very exotic material here. Yttrium iron garnet's not very exotic. The envy centers are not uh, exotic at this point. Uh, there are a lot of uh, potentially interesting new materials that have very sharp optical line widths that I think will be fun to look for magnon dynamics. So thanks for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Sure. So, in the case of the uh, in, in the case of the spin to magnon occupancy transduction, there is no uh, expectation that you will connect to the optical side. You'll do that in a different way. It's just trying to get your um, your stationary qubit, that's your NV excitation, transduced into a, the flying qubit in this case, which would be your magnon. And then from that, you'll come back into the NV. So um, I, di I didn't at all worry about getting to the, the optical side of things, but that, that is definitely a serious challenge in general. Thank you. 
these bars. You know, he talked about the you know, manufacturing tolerances for the discs. I don't think he mentioned them, the other one. Right. So, uh, you know, that's sort of related to how this, um, how this coupling strength changes across here. So I'm picking a mode that is not a very high frequency mode, uh, not a very short wavelength mode. So in principle, it shouldn't be as sensitive. But no, we haven't done a, a calculation of the CERN about that. You know, it, all of these are going to need to be trimmed at this point. And uh, I think I worry quite a bit about the, about the control of the detuning, because the detuning has to be um, under control. If you change that detuning by a factor of two, then you're going to change your coupling by a very substantial amount, and then you won't know what your timing is. So I think the, the picture that we would have with this, which is not a very practical um, large-scale integrated picture is that you would have to measure the response for your given system and then you have to optimize your gating sequence for that particular system never it's something that's going to work for a billion qubits but at the moment we'd be happy to have a thousand qubits that would be fantastic or maybe two in this system I remember complaining about a paper that I had that was rejected to, uh, to Lu Sham. And uh, he said, well, you know, the Kohn Sham paper was rejected by physical review letters for not being of broad interest. This is a paper that at a certain point had more citations than any other paper in physical review for the previous half century. So, you know, it's, it's just, uh, there, there is, there's an intellectual ecosystem that expects that things are possible. And it, it's hard to imagine that these things could be done. And uh, that's the kind of thing that, that I think referees can have challenges with. Uh, well, so um, I hope that I have indicated that the range of material properties that could be useful is, is quite large. And um, and also the ways that materials can be bad. <laughs> so it, it, it depends on it depends on focus and choice. So you can try to get a material that's going to behave better than other people's materials that they're already looking at that at that feature, or you can try to look at materials that have some characteristics that are broadly interesting. And you know, so I can say that for me, one of the places I'm placing my bets because uh, we all place bets with our time is rare earth doped materials. They are, uh, they exhibit remarkably narrow line widths. They're very good spin photon interfaces. The efficiencies are exceptionally poor, but there are some, I think, good pathways to possibly increase that. And if you can get a rare earth doped material that has sort of an intake that's similar in broadband responsiveness as an NV center, then I think that would transform that field. Yeah, vanadium tetracyanoethylene. <laughs> Say it three times very fast. Yes. So um, this material is a, is a magical material. It is probably not unique comes out of this little wrinkly area of 
organic chemistry, which not very many people are active in. And I think a lot of people, based on the implications for quantum information, are starting to dive into this really fast. Um, there are a lot of related organic materials. The advantage of doing it with the chemical synthesis approach is that uh, you can avoid many of the issues that are intrinsic to YIG. So YIG is a rare earth based material. So there always are going to be impurities for the yttrium because chemically it's very similar. With the chemical approach, you don't have that issue, different issues, but you don't have that particular issue. So the low temperature line width for vanadium tetracyanoethylene is exceptional. And it doesn't have the kind of low temperature issues that uh, seem to emerge all the time with, with YIG. Nope, nope, it can be deposited on glass. It's, I mean, this is evaporative deposition. This is the beauty of, uh, of chemical synthesis. It's, uh, and there are many materials that are like this. There are analogs to that. There are also, um, I think there is a whole category of materials that are called Prussian blue analogs that have related uh, behavior to that. And the people looked at for molecular magnetism a while ago, but are now turning around and saying, do some of these features that they exhibit, are they advantageous for, uh, for quantum information? The key thing for vanadium tetracyanoethylene was showing that the propagating modes had very low damping. So usually people will do an FMR experiment and there were chemists had done FMR experiments beforehand, but they had not done antenna-based launch and retrieve. They hadn't actually seen that it propagates and that the uh, the, the, the damping is very low in those systems. That's the key enabling characteristic. What was micro overlunch? Uh,